would you lead us in prayer, please, sir? Let's turn page 58. Page 58. sometimes. <laughs> All right, young man, go. Brother. <laughs> time, not just some of the time. <laughs> Amen. Good to see everybody here tonight. And uh, here in a little bit, we'll get into the book of Revelation. But we do have a special guest with us this evening, Courtney Mathis from Vision Baptist Missions. Uh, missionary to the country of Bolivia, and we've got her uh, display there uh, in the back. If you'd like to visit that, please do that at the end of the service. Sign up for the prayer letter, and uh, we're always encouraged to get missionaries in here where you can uh, meet them, see them, see what God's doing in and through their life, and also what he's planning on doing through them when they get there on the mission field. So, Courtney, if you would, you come around here, share your burden for the country of Bolivia with us, if you don't mind. so much Pastor Elrod for allowing me to be here tonight. It is just such an honor and privilege to be here. Um, as Pastor said, my name is Courtney Mathis and I'm a missionary to Bolivia with Vision Baptist Missions. A little bit of information about myself. I grew up uh, going to church and at the age of 12 I realized that salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior and not the works that I was trusting in as a young girl. Um, but I got sh baptized shortly after that, but it wasn't until later in life that the Lord really started burdening me for missions. And after high school, I had the opportunity to uh, take my first mission trip to Latin America. And while I was there, I was able to witness a father and daughter being baptized. And they were the first two in their small little tribe to hear the gospel in their own language and to accept Jesus as their savior and to be baptized. And the Lord used that event to show me that 
not everyone grows up in church hearing the gospel from a young age, and he really burdened my heart through that for missions, and so surrendered my life to him on that trip to do what I, whatever he would call me to do and to go where he would call me to go. It wasn't until 2016, though, that I learned about Vision Baptist Missions and the Our Generation Training Center. So in 2017, I moved down here from Georgia, from North Carolina, to attend the Our Generation Training Center. And after about two and a half years of Bible classes and missions classes and getting hands-on ministry experience at Vision Baptist Church, I had the opportunity to take a six-month internship uh, in Bolivia with veteran church planning missionaries Kevin and Beth White. And uh, while I was there, I was able to start learning Spanish and language school during the week, as well as help in the church plants and the women's and children's ministries down there. And I just got very practical uh, foreign missions training while I was there. And uh, the Lord also used that time to burden my heart for the people in Bolivia and uh, the need of the gospel, to show me the need of the gospel there in two major ways. The first one was uh, through my eyes and lamentations. It says that our eye affecteth our heart, and that is so true. And while I was there, I was able to learn about their culture and where the Bolivians are coming from. And over 80% of Bolivians come from an indigenous descent. And because of that, their uh, indigenous practices have been handed down from generation to generation. And uh, that includes sacrifices to false gods and trusting in their own works to save them. And the first thing that I really learned about this was going to a tour of some Inca ruins there in Bolivia. And the tour guide showed us the spot where the Incas would sacrifice llamas to the Pachamama uh, to gain favors from her. And I just, I didn't think much about it. I thought it was just something that happened back in the time of the Incas. And then one day I was walking to language school and I smelled something in the air and I wasn't exactly sure what I was smelling. And later that night I found out that on the first Friday of every month, most Bolivians will burn incense and offer incense to the Pachamama to, uh, to cover their sins from the previous month and to ask for favor and blessings in the upcoming month. Uh, and through this, I learned more about their, their religions and their, and their traditions of sacrifices to false gods. Um, in February, there is a week-long holiday called Carnival, and during this week, they believe that God has turned his back on them and they can fulfill all the lust of their flesh and do as they please. And uh, to kick off this holiday in the city of Oruro, a lot of people will go parading down the street, dancing, wearing costumes that resemble devils uh, and demons and different things. And they will go into a cave and they will offer sacrifices to a tío, uh, which is translated to the uncle, and it's what they call the devil. And so they will go into this small little cave and sacrifice llamas and incense and all types of different things to el tío to kick off this week-long holiday in which they believe that they can just do however they please. Um, and the children growing up in Bolivia just think it's a fun week where they get to dance in parades, throw water balloons at their friends, and spray people with silly string. But as they grow up, they learn the true meaning behind this, relig uh, behind this holiday, and they too will start uh, offering sacrifices to, this to these false gods and uh, learning to trust in their own works to save them instead of knowing that God sent his son to die on the cross for them. And the Lord really used this uh, to burn my heart for the children growing up there in Bolivia uh, and just hoping that someone would be able to share the gospel with them so that way they can grow up in church as I had the privilege to as well. The, the second way that the Lord really burdened my heart for Bolivia was through his word. In 2 Corinthians 5.18, the Bible tells us that we were reconciled back to God and that he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And the Lord, when I read that, just showed me that I have a responsibility to go to the people in Bolivia and to share the gospel with them. And if I don't, then I'm not sure who else will. Uh, and so when I go back to Bolivia, I'll be continuing to work under the Whites, the, the Whites, Kevin and Beth White. They've been in Bolivia for uh, 15 years now, just about, and they've started three churches, and uh, they have also started a Bible college. Lord willing, at the end of this year to the beginning of the next year, they're looking to start a fourth church plant with one of the guys that is graduating from the Bible college. And so I'll have the opportunity to work in the three churches, um, four churches that are there, uh, in the women's and children's ministries, um, and just going and reaching the young women and the children there um, and discipling them. Girls like Jesenia, she was one of the girls in the call in the uh, in the church while I was there, and uh, this not this year, but the last year during when I was there, she gave her testimony during the new year as, as we were celebrating, and she told us the story of how she was saved. Her and her brother lived with her mom. Her parents were separated, um, and her mom kicked her her and her brother out on the streets because um, she just didn't want to deal with them anymore, and she was just kind of over being 
uh, their their mom and just didn't want them. And so she kicked them out. And one of the ladies in our church, Esperanza, she knew of their situation. She was a family friend, and she took them and brought them to church. And uh, Jesenia heard the gospel, and uh, she was saved. And she has been continuing to grow in her relationship with the Lord. But as she told us her testimony, she told us that uh, the day her mom kicked her out on the street, she decided that next week she was going to kill herself, that she was going to commit suicide because she had no more hope left in the world and no one loved her and no one wanted her. Uh, but luckily, Esperanza stepped in and brought her to church and she realized that someone does love her. God loved her and sent her son to die on the cross for her sins. And she accepted Jesus as her savior and she's been continuing in, di in discipleship with one of the whites girls uh, in Bolivia and she's just growing and learning so much more. And I just praise the Lord that she didn't kill herself and that she was able to come to church and to be saved. And uh, my hope is to to reach more women in Bolivia who are in the same situation as Jacinia, so that way they don't have to think that there is no hope and that no one wants them and no one loves them. So I ask that you would pray for me as I've just started on deputation. Uh, January is when I first started traveling around, and it's just been an amazing two months of going to different churches and meeting lots of different people. But more importantly, I ask that you would pray for the almost 12 million people in Bolivia who are lost and on their way to hell, trusting in their own works to save them. And lastly, I ask that you would pray for more gospel laborers to rise up and go to Bolivia to share the gospel with the women and children there. Thank you so much, Pastor Elrod. Amen. Appreciate that testimony and information uh, about the country of Bolivia. And uh, I was thinking as she was talking about that particular holiday, it makes you sound like a lot that kind of goes on here in the United States and New Orleans and some of the places there. As people think that's what it's about, but uh, just doing whatever they want to and uh, fulfilling the lust of their flesh and trusting in their works and all these other things and uh, powerful uh, as you consider uh, what she was talking about with that young girl. So you you remember them and uh, remember her as she's raising that support. We need much prayer for that. And if you'd like to uh, give uh, to Courtney uh, and help her out along the way, uh, you'll be free to do that after the service today. Everything you give will go directly to her for that. And we appreciate her being here with us tonight. If you would, take your Bible and be found in the book of Revelation, chapter number 19. Revelation, chapter number 19. We're going to look at the first few verses here in this chapter As we consider here we've been dealing with the last uh, few chapters about the judgment of the city of Babylon And all that will take place with that We've tried to lay that out and say this is a future um, rebuilding of this city It's a great city that's been the thorn in the flesh for the people of God throughout the ages and so we got to Revelation 17, uh, Revelation 18, we see there's smoke uh, there that's ascending up because of the judgment that was made upon that city. But now we see a contrast. Now we see our focal point is turned back to heaven, and we see all the uh, worship uh, in response to God judging this great city of Babylon. Chapter number 19, verse number 1. John says, and after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Now, the great whores we talked about in Revelation 17 and 18, we talked about the beast, we talked about that great city and all those things. But you notice of one of four alleluias that you see in these first six verses. The word there, alleluia, is a transliteration from Greek, the same word as we find in the Hebrew, hallelujah, which means praise ye Jehovah. Praise ye Jehovah. And so you see a contrast from what takes place on earth with judgment. And in response to that, it says, much people in heaven are rejoicing over the fact that this city and the great whore has been judged. goes on to say in verse number 2, as a response, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Now I want you to take your Bible real quick, and I want you to flip back to Revelation chapter number 6. 
Revelation chapter number 6. There was a question that was asked over there in Revelation 6 uh, concerning judgment. And we see the answer or the fulfillment of it here in what we read in Revelation 17 and 18. Revelation chapter number 6 and look in verse number 9. Verse number 9. There's a group that's rejoicing, says that has avenged the blood of of his servants at her hand revelation 6 verse number 9 and when he had opened the fifth seal i saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of god and for the testimony which they held and they cried with a loud voice saying how long o lord holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth now he has they were asking that here. Remember, it's their soul. He said, I saw the souls of them. They have not been bodily resurrected, but their souls there. We talked about that, how about a soul can hear, a soul can see, a soul can feel. We saw that at the, the rich man there in hell in Luke 16. But they asked a question about how long do you not judge and avenge our blood? And so by the time we get here to Revelation 19, you know, as a course, if we've been going through this study, we've seen the events that have transpired leading up to this, and God does judge uh, the blood and avenge the blood of his servants. Verse number 3 of Revelation 19, and again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. That's the judgment of the great city. Remember, as the merchants and the men that made money, they saw the destruction of this city, and the Bible says that they wept and they mourned over this city because in one hour, judgment has come to it, all their merchandise, all their possessions, all the great economic gain that they had from this city in a moment in time is gone. And that's what they had put their trust in. That's what, where their confidence was in. Verse number 4, and the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne saying, uh, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and the, uh, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And so all this is building up to the point that says God is righteous, God is true. He will judge and avenge his servants. Now, verse number 7, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Now, I've preached two messages on the bride of Christ, and so I did that in the book of Ephesians, and I've already done that here at one point in the book of Revelation, but I just want to just remind you of a few things as we consider this concerning this marriage of the Lamb. It is my persuasion, as comparing Scripture to Scripture, letting Scripture be our authority, that the bride of Christ, or the bride, the Lamb's wife, it's uh, really the, the phrase that we need to use, is not the church, which is his body. It is the nation of Israel. Now, I want to just remind you of a few things as we consider this. This says that the marriage of the lamb has come. The marriage of the lamb, and it says his wife hath made herself ready. So the wife, through this process, has made herself ready for the marriage. Now that could be foreign for you and I because we don't make ourselves ready. Christ has made us complete in him the moment that we trust him as our Savior. And so what did the wife make herself ready through? Well, she made herself ready through the tribulation. Through this seven years, there's been a purification process to bring this wife, the bride, the lamb's wife, to a point where now she's ready to receive the bridegroom. Verse number 8, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Let's do a little cross-referencing here, and we'll uh, end back here tonight. I want you to go to the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter number 54, Isaiah 54. If you don't believe me concerning that, just ask John when we get to the next few chapters. He says, let me show you the bride, the lamb's wife. 
And he showed me that city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, going as a bride for her husband. Isaiah 54, Isaiah 54, verse number 1. Sing, O barren, that thou didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. Verse number five, for thy maker is thine, what? Husband. The host, uh, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken, and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth. When thou wast refused, saith thy God, for in for a, a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. Notice this. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment. Is this not what the time we're talking about here, the time of wrath? And a time, He says, just for a little bit I hid my face from thee during this time of wrath, but with everlasting kindness... Will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. Go to Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62. And look in verse number 1. Isaiah 62, verse number 1. Here's why this is important. If the body of Christ is the bride, then we're going to the tribulation. There's no way around it. There is, there is no way around it because the bride doesn't make herself ready until the end of that seven years. Isaiah 62, for Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteous thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory, thou, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Verse number 4, listen here. Thou shalt no more be turned forsaken. Remember what he said over there? In a little wrath, hid my face from you. Neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hezebah, and thy land Beulah. And everyone we sing, Beulah land, I'm longing for you. Where will they get that song from? Well, I can tell you where that lands at. By the way, that this isn't talking about heaven. And that song's not talking about heaven. And I like the song, and if we sing the song, Tim, I'm going to be belting it out. But this song, or this verse, is talking about land. Land that he promised to a group of people. Okay? Stay with me. For the Lord delighteth in thee, that's what Hephzibah means, and thy land shall be what? Married. That's Beulah. You're going to marry land. That's strange. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as a bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Let's go to the book of Jeremiah real quick. We're going through these quickly. Jeremiah chapter number 3. I've talked about these before, but I wanted you to see them again as it relates to this topic of us going through the tribulation, which we're not. But whoever this is, and we again, we consider this to be the bride, the lamb's wife, they most certainly are going through it and will be purged and be ready to receive the bridegroom. We're going to find out who the bridegroom is. Don't read ahead. Jeremiah chapter number 3 and drop down to verse number 6. The Lord said unto me in the days of Josiah the king, 
Has thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me, but she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery. That's what Israel did as a nation. Spiritual adultery, fornication, idol worship. I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. That's what he did to him. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Go to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah chapter number 31. Look in verse number 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. This is concerning the new covenant for the house of Israel. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. That's the old covenant. Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and they will and I and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they uh, shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. And I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now, I want you to go to Matthew chapter number 25. Matthew chapter number 25. As you're flipping there again, we're going to talk about this in greater detail when we get to Revelation chapter number 21. But very simply, the bride has made herself ready. Now, it also mentioned there in Revelation 19 concerning this marriage supper that takes place. Again, I'll read it to you as you're finding Matthew chapter number 25. And let's look in verse number 31. Actually, Matthew 25, verse number 1. Go there at the beginning of the chapter. It says this, And to her was granted that she found, or that she should be arrayed in fine linen, uh, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And it says in verse number 9 of Revelation 19, And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, most people would, would say that the marriage supper takes place in heaven. I submit to you it takes place on planet earth at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 25, and look in verse number 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the, who are they going to meet? The bridegroom, okay? Five of them were wise, five were foolish. Now, if you understand the context of Matthew 24 and 25, you know we're dealing with the tribulation, okay? So at the return of Christ, here comes the bridegroom. John the Baptist said that he's the friend of the bridegroom. He rejoices over the bridegroom. So for lack of a better illustration, John the Baptist, when Jesus shows up, he's the best man. He's preparing a people for their Messiah, the bridegroom for the bride. And he says, in this is my joy full, is what John said. Now, kingdom of heaven is likened unto ten virgins. They take their lamps, they go forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them are wise, five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took the oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Bridegroom's there, they're slumbering, they're sleeping. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Okay? Now, the bridegroom coming back, there's a great cry to come meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. We might say their lamps didn't endure to the end, did they? What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter number 24? He that endures to the end shall be saved of the kingdom gospel. That's what he told them, didn't he? Verse number 9, But the wise answered, saying, Not so, 
lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Now I have a thought on that, and again, I don't know if I could technically prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. But it's strange that these wise tell those unwise to go buy something. Now you know this is in the tribulation, and the only ones that can buy or sell are those that took what? That's interesting, isn't it? They told me, go buy it for yourself. Well, those that are wise in that day, they won't take the mark or worship the beast, will they? Those that are unwise, they most certainly will. Verse number 10, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready. Remember what Jesus told them in Matthew 24, In an hour that you think not, the Son of Man will come. And when they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, open, Lord, Lord, open unto us. He answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye neither, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Go to Matthew 25. Now, these will get to go into the marriage supper of the Lamb that takes place upon the return of Christ. Okay? Now, Matthew 25, here's another crowd that will get to enter in to the kingdom and get to attend the marriage supper of the Lamb. Matthew 25, verse number 31. Matthew 25, 31. And I'm flying through these. I'm proud of myself. I've only got a few more left. And all God's people said... Amen. All right. All right. Matthew uh, 25, verse number 31 says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. So remember, that was what was promised to Christ. Remember when the angel Gabriel showed up there and told Mary, I'm going to give him the throne of his father, David. Okay, that Davidic throne. That's what Jesus is going to sit on there when he comes back. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered, and he gave me meat. I was thirsty, and he gave me drink. I was a stranger, and he took me in. Naked, and he clothed me. I was sick, and he visited me. I was in prison, and he came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When uh, saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say uh, unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, and you need to underscore or highlight this, my brethren, my brethren. Now the one speaking here is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ wasn't Chinese. He wasn't American, and I know American English we <laughs> didn't exist right here at this point. But you understand Jesus Christ he was a Jew. By the way, he still is. He's a line of the tribe of Judah, isn't he? So he says, when you helped out my brethren, when you saw them hungry, thirsty, naked, when you, through this seven-year period, when you saw the Jewish people in need and you assisted to their need, you did it unto me. As a result of that, you will get to enter into and you will inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You did it to one of the least of these, my brethren. You have done it unto me. So what do you have here? You have the Gentile nations that are being assembled here to the judgment of the nations. There's a separation. John chapter number 10, Jesus said, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. The sheep that he was talking about in the Gospels was the little flock that he had, Peter being the ringleader of that crowd. He says, but there's other sheep. Well, who's the other sheep? You just read them right here. When he brings the nations together, 
he separates the believing Gentiles out of every nation, those that blessed Israel as a result of the Abrahamic covenant and believe the gospel of the kingdom. They go in, they are sheep now in his fold. The goats, the, the, the Gentile nations that did not believe the individuals out of those nations, they are on the left hand and they are going to go into, as you see in verse number 41, then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, and the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And the same thing that he told the crowd that gets to go in, he tells it to this crowd. He says, But you didn't do it unto the least of these, my brethren. Now, what does that have to do with you and I today? Well, we don't get to inherit these blessings by blessing Israel. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ the moment that we trust the gospel. Okay? But right here in Matthew 25, this is the entrance into get into this marriage supper. A few more places here, and we'll be concluding. Go to Luke 13. Luke chapter number 13. Luke 13, look in verse number 28. Actually, let's back up to verse number 24. Luke 13, verse number 24. Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many I say unto you will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. And once the master of the house has risen up, and hath shut, the, uh, shut to the door, and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Right? Knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Notice this. When ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets. In the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. He comes back. He gathers all things that offend and gets them out. Abraham, Jacob. Who else does it say? Isaac, all the prophets, they're resurrected. And guess what they get to inherit? That long-awaited kingdom. And they get to partake there in that marriage supper of the Lamb. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. Go to Luke 14. Luke 14. Two more passages and I'm done. Luke 14. And look in verse number 7 for the sake of time. Luke 14, verse number 7. He put forth a parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, set not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room but when thou art bidden go and sit in the lowest room and when he that uh, bade thee cometh he may say unto thee friend go up higher uh, then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee for whosoever exalt himself shall be abased and he that humble himself shall be exalted he said uh, all, uh, then said he also to him that bade him when thou uh, makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen nor the rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made to thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor and the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed, notice this, at the resurrection of the just. You know when we're about to read that in Revelation 20? You'll be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. That is the first resurrection, according to prophecy. They're going to be resurrected to inherit that kingdom. Now, he goes on to say in uh, this same passage, he says, And one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things. He said unto him, 
Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servants at supper time to say unto them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they with all, with one uh, consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I want you to know this, I just saw this as I was reading through it even today. Just like we saw over there that the wise tell the unwise, go buy something. Look what it says here. The first said unto him, I have bought. I've bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray they have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I have to go prove them. I pray they have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Somebody say, why didn't he buy anything? Well, he's married. He don't have any money anymore. <laughs> no, because he, he deals with that even putting family over him here in just a second, okay? So that that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets, into the lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind, and the Lord said, or excuse me, and the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. You can read Matthew 22, the same type context. They don't get to enter in. They don't get to partake in the supper. Now go down to verse number 25 and 26, and I'll be done. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife. What did that third one say? I just got married. Okay? And children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And he goes on to say much more than that. Listen to him. You know what Paul said? Love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. He didn't tell you to sell everything you got and give it to the poor and come after Christ. It's not what he told you, did he? And again, when you consider that in Revelation 19, as many people that want to make you be the bride, it doesn't make it so. Let's be who we are. Let's be the body of Christ. Let's be blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in him. And listen to me. That Matthew 25 passage will be true for those in the tribulation. If they bless Israel, God will bless them. But listen to me. You can be blessed now and have assurance of salvation today, not by taking hold of any of those, but this simple fact that we're all sinners. This pastor included probably more than anybody in this room. We've all come short of the glory of God. The glory of God is Jesus Christ. He was perfect. He was without sin. He's the God man. I can't save myself. Jesus Christ came to this world, lived a perfect life, died my death on the cross. Paul says that I am crucified with Christ. Paid my sin debt, was buried, and rose bodily again on the third day. And God says in his word, if I'll trust in that death, burial, and resurrection as the payment and satisfaction for my sins, he'll give to me his righteousness. To go to heaven, you've got to be as righteous as God is. The problem is, you and I, we can't earn that righteousness. All our righteousness are filthy rags in the sight of God. That's why we need the righteousness of another. And that other is Jesus Christ. And how you do that is you believe in your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ, his payment for your sin and bodily resurrection. He'll save you, and he'll keep you saved. Does that mean everything in your life is going to turn out the way that you wanted it to? Certainly not. Does that mean you'll be exempt from physical infirmity? Certainly not. Does that mean that you'll be exempt from uh, family issues and financial issues and everything else that everybody on planet Earth is subject to? Certainly not. But it does mean this. This will be the only time that you worry about them. That you'll have a home in heaven because of what Jesus Christ did for you. That's the good news of the gospel. Amen.
Amen. Let's stand to our feet tonight. I appreciate you being here. Appreciate your attending us to the Word of God. We'll uh, preach on the second coming of Christ. Notice I didn't get to those verses. I read them this morning, but we'll go through those, and then we got chapter 20 and 21 and 22, and then uh, Miss Joyce, she's already asking where we're going to go next. I said, I don't know, but we'll go. <laughs> I'll tell you this, we're not going to bite off another book like Revelation for a little while on Sunday night, but it's been a blessing, and I've learned uh, so much going through this. I hope you have too, uh, but I appreciate you being here on Sunday night, and uh, continue to remember people in our church, uh, sick and afflicted, uh, lift them up in prayer. Uh, continue to remember the Paget family uh, as well. Uh, any other prayer requests I need to make mention of tonight?